20, Jesus Calls Us. Trinity, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So friends, let us confess our sin together, trusting in God's promised mercy. <clears throat> Won't you please take a moment and read through the prayer that's printed in your bulletin, then we'll pray it together. have come down so that we might live in justice, friendship, and peace. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and restored and set on right path.
turn and show the peace of Christ with each other. Good morning. I'm glad you all are here. And if you're not here, I'm glad you can be with us as you watch this service in the presence of whoever is with you in um, the arms of God in Christ. Um, on this Sunday, on this, as my grandchildren reminded me last night, it's a long weekend because of that man. <laughs> what man is that? And my almost 18-year-old granddaughter, Sarah, said, you know, Christopher Columbus. <laughs> no, Sarah, I think you mean Martin Luther King Jr. Oh, that's right. Well, I guess they, I'm not sure what history they're teaching. <laughs> But anyway, um, and this will be a historic week, um, and we'll hopefully all will be peaceful on the days leading up to and including Wednesday. Um, I call your attention to the names on your prayer list. And at the same time, the names and situations that are on your heart, are there any that we need to include? Just an update on Peter, my brother is in Parliament, praying the Lord that he's, from what I read, he seems to be doing better. He's now at the Children's Hospital for rehab, but before my prayer won't you lift these names and not just today but as you go through your week um, lift them the ones on your heart before the mercy seat of God let us pray Holy One, you have called for justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. On this Sunday, as we remember the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., help us to embody the justice and righteousness that he sought for our country. Help us to embody his dream of a beloved community and of a day when justice is a reality for all Americans, not just the few. Inspire us by his example and by the power of your spirit at work within us to live in solidarity with all who have been marginalized in our world. Give us ears to hear their cries and hearts that move us to respond. Indeed, during these tumultuous days of political and social reckoning, give us courage to pursue accountability for all who have 
incited and inflicted this violence upon the nation and courage to recognize our own complicity in the racism that has warped our common life. Animate courage in us so that we might confront realities that deform and deface our country and participate in your reconciling and justice-seeking work in our midst. Hear our prayers also for peace in the days ahead as we navigate transitions in the nation's leadership. Grant all of our elected leaders wisdom and patience and courage to work together for the common good and to restore a spirit of partnership among us. God, our help in times of trouble, we continue to pray for the global community as it grapples with an ever worsening pandemic. We pray that you would give each of us determination to take personal responsibilities for measures that protect us all. We pray especially for the well-being of those hit hardest by the strains of discourage and pray for those in leadership in our communities, states, and nations as they negotiate ways in which to aid those most afflicted. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together the prayer which is the sum of all prayers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we come to hear scripture read and proclaimed, let us pray that the Spirit will open our hearts and minds. O oh God, send your Spirit to us that we might discern your word amid the words we read today, so that in hearing your word, we may be formed to follow Christ into our world. Amen. First reading for today is 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10. The Lord appears to Samuel. In those days when the boy Samuel was serving the Lord under the direction of Eli, there were very few messages from the Lord and visions from him were quite rare. One night, Eli, who was now almost blind, was sleeping in his own room. Samuel was sleeping in the sanctuary where the sacred covenant box was. Before dawn, while the lamp was still burning, the Lord called Samuel. He answered, Yes, sir, and ran to Eli and said, You call me, here I am. But Eli answered, I didn't call you, go back to bed. So Samuel went back to bed. The Lord called Samuel again. The boy did not know that it was the Lord because the Lord had never spoken to him before. So he got up, went to Eli and said, You called me and here I am. But Eli answered, My son, I didn't call you, go back to bed. The Lord called Samuel a third time. He got up, went to Eli, and said, You called me, and here I am. Then Eli realized that it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to him, Go back to bed, and if he calls you again, say, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. The Lord came and stood there and called as he had before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, Speak, your servant is listening.
from John's Gospel. The first chapter, another call story. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Amen. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. Samuel put on his pajamas and went to bed. It was easy for him to find his way in the semi-darkness. The lamp of God was lit, and he had been at the temple since he was a small boy. His mother, Hannah, had brought him here. Can you imagine? Samuel was a miracle baby. Everyone, including Hannah, believed she was barren until the day she went to the temple at Shiloh and prayed for a child. She would do anything to conceive, including give the baby back to God. The old temple priest, Eli, heard her prayer, blessed it, and true to her word, she brought her baby boy, Samuel, back to Eli as soon as he was weaned. So it happened that Samuel grew up in the temple of Shiloh, serving Eli, who was 90 years old, if he was a day, and going blind on top of that. Samuel smiled when he thought of his mother. He missed her sometimes. What boy wouldn't? But he was proud that he had been promised by his mother to the Lord. Sometimes he got old, doing all the chores, toting this, cleaning up that. It was the cleaning that sometimes got to him, scrubbing the pots <laughs> that had been used to boil the slaughtered sacrifices. It couldn't have been a particularly pleasant childhood, even though Eli loved the boy as his own kin, loving the life that he brought into that dark, holy place. We can only imagine what life was like for Samuel as the faithful brought their offerings, their sin offerings, and their guilt offerings to the temple. They were burdened, ashen-faced people, most of them hauling their stubborn animals up to the altar to be killed. There was a great deal of blood, 
blood splattered on the altar and blood that splattered on the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the sanctuary. The burning incense helped a little, but the place stank, pure and simple. At night, Samuel lay down by the Ark of God, reputed to contain all the sacred relics of the nation's past, a container of manna, Aaron's budded rod, the tablets of the covenant. Sleeping near it must have been like sleeping in a graveyard. But Samuel was apparently used to it. Night after night with his hair smelling of smoke and of burning flesh and fat, he lay down next to it and pulled his cloak around him. Like the parent of a newborn, he didn't want to sleep too soundly in case old Eli called him during the night. Someone does call him out of the deep darkness of this particular night, not once, but three times. And three times he answers, here am I, and goes running to see what old Eli needs. But it's not Eli who beckons him. And by the third time, Eli's awakened, and Eli has a hunch who it might be. We're told Samuel does not yet know the Lord which seems rather odd, don't you think, for someone who has spent his whole life in God's house. I guess there is more to knowing God than just being in church. Anyhow, instead of giving the boy a tongue lashing, for continually disturbing Eli's sleep, Eli rubs the sleep out of his eyes, fetches a cup of coffee, <laughs> and tells Samuel what to say the next time he hears the voice. Say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And Samuel does. This is a turning point because Samuel is no longer a child, no longer a temple lackey who comes running at the sound of his name. Instead, he's become a young man, a servant of God, who is ready to hear what the Lord has to say to him. And I thought sleeping next to the ark was hard. The message takes courage to hear. It condemns Eli's house forever. Old, blind Eli. The only family Samuel has ever known. Damned because his loudish sons have gotten into the bad habit of stealing the best cuts of meat from the temple and taking them home to roast. Eli had warned them, but he couldn't make them stop. Now the piper has to be paid and poor Samuel doesn't want to tell Eli what he has heard. The next morning, he opens up the temple as usual. And when Eli calls him as usual, Samuel answers him, as usual. Here I am. He wants things back to the usual, predictable way they were. He wants to remain a child. But Eli knows better. What did he tell you? The boy balks. 
But Eli makes it clear that he, like Samuel, is ready to hear the message, the righteousness, the judgment, the bone-rattling power of it that lets Eli know exactly who the message is from. It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And so it comes to pass that the boy counted on to be his eyes shows Eli the fiery vision of his own destruction. Now if that is what happens when you answer voices in the night, then thank you very much. I think I would rather iron. <laughs> Does anyone really want to hear the voice of the living God? I wonder. I wonder which is worse, to hear it or not to hear it. To face fainting at the power of it or to live oblivious to it, eaten up by the thousand little fears that prevented ever getting through. I wonder if when I wake up in the middle of the night worrying about what I'm going to wear, buy at the grocery store, take to the cleaners, and where is my red blouse? Since the children are all out of the house and homes of their own, I can't blame missing articles of clothing on them. But I wonder if all that wool gathering, as my mama used to call it, is a way of avoiding saying, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Maybe I'm afraid I'll hear something. Maybe I'm afraid I won't. But all the evidence points toward hearing something at least eventually. It's our faith and hope that since the beginning of time when God's word created heaven and earth, through the word God gave to Abraham and our forebears, through the word made flesh in Jesus, God has been speaking to us and is still speaking to us, but God has never forced us to hear. If and when we choose to hear, we could do worse than to claim Samuel as our patron saint and remember his story of how the Lord waited to speak until Samuel declared his readiness to hear. It took the wisdom of a fellow traveler, old Eli, to help Samuel make sense of what was happening to him and discern the voice he heard. How there was no going back once he had heard the word of the Lord and how that word changed his life forever. It is no invitation to the faint-hearted, but it is an invitation we have all been issued just the same. See that you do not refuse to hear the voice that speaks, says the letter to the Hebrews. The truth is, it is the voice that is speaking to us always. Not only in the middle of the night 
Although that may be when it's easiest to hear and easiest to understand. The truth is, ever since God decided to speak through a person, the person of the Son, God's Word has come to us in our persons, in our bodies, in all the events of our lives, if only we can learn to hear what God is telling us. How can we find out? What is God trying, wanting, longing to say to us? God's message is different for each of us as different as our lives. Only our beginnings are the same. Our first step toward finding out when we are able to summon all our courage, open our mouths, and just say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And the people said, Amen. Amen. God has showered us with good gifts in response to this love let us give all who we are in return our hearts minds energies and resources and now won't you stand with me in body or spirit and let us sing hymn 69 i the lord of sea and sky
special friends. Listen for the Lord may be speaking to you amidst all the things that clamor for our attention. Listen. And then say, speak. I'm listening. Now may our good Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine brilliantly upon you. And may you this day and all days know and feel his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.